I was thinking this week, I wonder if Jesus ever healed someone that didn't want to be healed. Perhaps healing someone who would only resent him because of it. And I think he did. Uh, I think Jesus pushed people beyond their comfort zones regularly. And sometimes that included people that he helped or healed. But why would he do that? Why would he do that? Why would Jesus help someone who he knew would be ungrateful for their help? Why would he bother? This morning, as we look and we continue our series on Jesus' encounters with people, I think we are going to encounter one of those ungrateful people. Uh, It's in John 5, so if you'll turn with me to John 5, we'll get there in a moment. But in this story, Jesus tells, Jesus heals a man who is lame for 38 years. He is lame for 38 years. And I'm going to argue that the man was ungrateful to Jesus throughout the story. And I recognize in doing this, this is actually probably one of my harsher criticisms of a Bible character. You don't hear me criticizing Bible characters very much, but I think it is important to the story. And I think that uh, the case is, is strong enough. It's a cumulative case, but the case is strong enough to suggest that this character is not happy with Jesus. And not only not happy with Jesus, he's ungrateful to Jesus for what he's done. And it's ungratitude that the man alerts the authorities to the work of Jesus. But then Jesus does something interesting. So if only the healing was recorded, the, the passage would end in John 5, 15. But Jesus goes on to explain why he healed the man on the Sabbath. And it goes on for another 30 verses. <laughs> so we get a good explanation straight out of Jesus on why he does some of the things he does. This morning, I want us to look at the healing of the lame man and explore why Jesus performed this sign for an ungrateful man and an ungrateful people. So John 5, and I'll start with 5, 1 through 15. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now is the Sabbath on that day. That's a good place to stop. So the setting, we have moved from Cana of Galilee and we, Jesus is now in Jerusalem. So he's at the temple in Jerusalem. And they're at a pool called the Pool of Bethesda. Now it's commonly believed at the time that this pool had power to heal if those who entered it at a certain time. So you'll notice perhaps in your um, Bibles that chapter, uh, verse 3b, so the second half of 3, and 4 are put in brackets. I want to talk about this for just a second, just to kind of give you some heads up to what's going on. Um, It's in brackets for a reason. Perhaps your Bible notes it, perhaps it doesn't, but the brackets indicate that most scholars don't think these verses are original, that they're inserted later. And I would tend to agree with them. This is probably true. These verses are probably not uh, in the original manuscript. However, I think that they do capture an explanation that was early in the first century. And that explanation carries on even in verse um, 7 when the man talks about the water. That there is some understanding that this water had healing properties. And it would get stirred up. Uh, whether by, um, you know, natural spring or the belief of an angel stirring it up, and the first people to enter it would be healed. So while I do not think these verses, verse 3b and 4, 
are in the original text, they probably do capture thinking of the first century. They probably capture the thinking of the beliefs of the people in the first century. So the crowds gather at this pool in order to get healed. Okay, they gather and they, and they seek Jesus, or they seek healing from the waters, the special waters, and they, they have to wait for it to get stirred up. So the man, this is, I want to talk about the man. The, the man is, is there and he's been there for 38 years. And he sits and he waits and he sits and he waits and he sits and he waits. And I'm going to argue that the man is ungrateful for a couple of reasons. First, uh, he has no urgency. The man has no urgency. In verses 5 and 6, a man who had been there ill for 38 years. And Jesus, when he saw them, knew that he had already been there a long time in that condition. The man has been ill for 38 years and has no initiative to enter the water. Uh, he ends up... <clears throat> He, he, Jesus knows he's been there a long time. The man's had plenty of opportunities, but he can neither uh, get himself there nor convince someone else to get him there. Now, we know there, there are other people who meet Jesus, and they are very motivated to get to Jesus. I think of the man whose friends take him down through a roof in order to meet Jesus. There are lots of people who take initiative. This man has no initiative. Now, I do want to make a note being ill for a long time doesn't mean that you're ungrateful. Being ill for a long time, being ill for 38 years doesn't make you ungrateful. For this man, in this case, I'm making a collective argument about his general condition. So I want to be very careful not just to say, if you have been sick for 38 years, you are ungrateful. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm saying this is one symptom for this particular man in this particular story. I think it's a factor, but it's not the only factor. Now, because of the lack of urgency in this man, he cannot compel others to take him down and he will not go himself. An interesting uh, Harvard professor, uh, John Cotter, who is interested in change and the study of change, uh, talks about the, the need, the need for creating urgency if you want to change something. He said, without a sense of urgency, people won't give that extra effort that is often essential. They won't make needed sacrifices. Instead, they cling to the status quo and resist initiatives from above. So I want to, I want to suggest that the man has no initiative. And so that is the first symptom of his ungratefulness. Second, I think the man has no desire to get well. Chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? How does the man answer? He doesn't respond with a straight yes, and he doesn't respond with a straight no either. In verse 7, the man answered him, sir... I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. The man does not offer an immediate yes, I think is indicative of his situation. He's not particularly interested in changing his situation. He is okay with where he's at. And not only that, he offers excuses for why he has not already been made better. You know, sometimes when when you have a, a situation that you're stuck in, so this man has been stuck for 38 years, you become myopic about the solutions to your problem. You get stuck thinking there's only one way to solve this problem. There's only one way forward. And for this man, the one way forward was to get into the water, which he wasn't getting into and he wasn't convincing anyone to get into. But that's the only solution that he saw for his, for his problem, for his health, for his illness. If I'm stuck and I only see one way out, and that way out doesn't work, I'm going to be stuck for a long time. How many of you have ever uh, driven your car in snow and ice and you get your car stuck in ice? You know, maybe you've parked your car in the driveway overnight and the ice storm comes in the middle of the night and you go out to your car and you want to back up your car 
and all you do is spin wheels. How many of you have ever done that? I did that last year. There was this, we actually lived, we had a slight incline down. So uh, we had rear wheel drive, slight incline down, and ice. So my car was not going anywhere. <laughs> so if I, all I did, if all I ever did was sit in my car and try to hit the pedal so that it made my wheel spin, I would only be spinning wheels for as long as my car had rubber tires to spin wheels for. I have to come up with a different solution. I have to start thinking outside of that box. I put down salt, I put down uh, dirt, whatever it is to get you unstuck. When we desire to get better, we stop offering excuses. We stop trying to be myopic. So I think this man has no desire to get better. He only has one solution, and that's the only solution that he will accept. Third, the man actually ends up with no relationship with Jesus. So he's, uh, as he's healed in verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And immediately the man became well, picked up his pallet, and began to walk. And it was a Sabbath. In verses 10 and 11. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is a Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, who is this man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. The man doesn't even know who healed him. I find this interesting. If I was healed uh, and I was able to walk, and I understand there's probably quite a bit of confusion because all of a sudden he can walk and get up and go, I, I would think that I would try to figure out who just healed me. And even if I didn't quite capture his name as he left, I would assume some of the crowd around me might know. And yet this man does not inquire of the crowd around him either. Jesus does heal him with simple words. If you recall the nobleman's son last week, Jesus also healed with simple words. Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. That's what Jesus tells this man, which he does, so at least he's obedient. And that's the sign. But then the man leaves. He doesn't bother to figure out who Jesus is, and Jesus leaves. Jesus slips out through the crowd. So he has no relationship with Jesus after this healing event. That's interesting. And I think it adds to the continued case for an ungratefulness. But then further, fourth, the man has no responsibility for his actions. So he is caught, he is healed, he has picked up his mat, and he has started walking. Now, according to Jewish tradition at the time, you couldn't carry something from one location to another location. So you couldn't carry, say, a mat from your house to the springs. Okay, so this is on the Sabbath. You, you weren't allowed to carry something from one location to another. So he is clearly breaking this tradition. And when the leadership confronts him, why are you carrying this mat? What are you doing? What does the man say? He doesn't say, yes, I'm, I'm carrying this mat. Verse 11, he says, uh, he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. I'm carrying my mat because that guy said so. <laughs> I'm carrying the mat because that guy said so. I'm blaming him. And, and he told me to do it. So that's, that's a case of maybe a little bit of ingratitude. He actually blames Jesus. He's throwing Jesus under the bus for his own activity. Now, you could say, one, certainly the Jewish leaders at this point missed the bigger thing. A man who was lame for 38 years is walking. They are certainly complicit in this. The man also seems to miss this. I have, he doesn't say, I have not been able to walk for 38 years. Of course I'm standing up, carrying my mat, and walking around. No, he just says, that guy told me to, told me to do it. I don't even know his name, but that guy, some, that guy. Isn't that interesting? He takes no responsibility for his actions. And then finally, the man, the ungrateful man, as this case is beginning to be built, has no allegiance to Jesus at all. After Jesus finds the man in the temple, Jesus finds the man in the temple. Here in verse 12, uh, verse uh, 14. After Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. 
So Jesus finds him in the temple. Jesus is the one who again initiates a relationship. What's the man do? Verse 15. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. What does the man do when he finds Jesus? When he finds the man who healed him? When he finds the man who changed his life from being not able to walk one day to walking? He reports him to the authorities who are looking for him because of his teaching. In other words, he's an informant. He's pointing his finger at Jesus for who he is. So the man has no urgency. He's been stuck there for 38 years. He has no desire to get better. He, he doesn't seem to want to get particularly well. He has no relationship with Jesus. Jesus, he doesn't even know who healed him after the moment. He has no responsibility for his actions. He actually blames Jesus for him carrying his own mat. And then at the end, he has no allegiance to Jesus. He, he informs on Jesus to those who are seeking him. This is the result of shallow faith, which is what we talked about last week. Remember, we talked about shallow faith and deep faith. The nobleman moves from shallow faith to deep faith in that story. The lame man in this story stays in the shallow end, selfish, skeptical, stuck. And I think this week we could add no urgency, no desire, no relationship, no responsibility, no allegiance. Those are characteristics of shallow faith. So what do we do with this? Uh, first, uh, we have been the lame man. I think one of the reasons the story is in here is because uh, we ourselves have been people who have been in desperate need, but found with no urgency to change and no desire to get well. We need Jesus. Isn't that true for all of us? We need Jesus. This is one of the reasons he does this. We need him. We need him to initiate his relationship with us. Even after he does, we often turn our backs on him. We often turn our backs on him. It's called sin. Right? Even after he does, we are ungrateful. We stop listening at some point. Every one of us. I could ask you how many of you have sinned this last week, and maybe all of you would raise your hands, and if you didn't, you should raise your hand at that point. <laughs> Jesus helps us like he does with the lame man, right? Even though we are ungrateful, even though we have no urgency in our lives for his help, even though we don't necessarily want to get well, Jesus still helps us. So why does Jesus help us? Why does Jesus go through these uh, actions? Why does he do what he has done? And I think Jesus gets this picture and he begins to tell us actually in the, in the following verses. So let's turn uh, to verses 16 through 30. And I'll read it all at once, uh, and then I'm just going to highlight a couple of points that Jesus makes about what he is doing. Verse 16. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even though so the Son also gives life to those whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me 
has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to the resurrection of life those who committed the evil deeds to resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own initiative as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So that's a long explanation. And then he goes on in the next section, which we will not look at today, to talk about the witnesses to this claim. So why does Jesus heal the man? What is Jesus trying to prove and accomplish? Why does he do it on the Sabbath of all days? Why not pick a less controversial day? We wouldn't have this argument if Jesus healed him not on the Sabbath. But Jesus is demonstrating that he works. And he works to heal a lame man. And the works are accomplished on the Sabbath because of who he is. Listen, everything that Jesus says from this point on is grounded on his identity. He is trying to prove who he is. The summary of his proof is, I am one with the Father. Summary statement, Jesus has unity with the Father. If you look at verse 17 and 18, I think this is the, the summarizing point of everything that follows after this. Verse 17, but my Father is working until now, and I myself am working. This is Jesus' declaration. He's saying, the Father is still at work now. Okay, so what, what's he getting at here? In Genesis 2, 2 and 3, when God creates the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rests, all right, God rests from his creative work. But he continues working. This is also Jewish thought at the time. He continues working because he upholds the universe. I think this is still true today. If God stopped working, if he actually completely stopped working, the universe would implode. Right? It's God's active hand that keeps the universe at bay. <laughs> okay? That's, that's the point. And now he stops creating but he doesn't stop working. That's, that's the point that Jesus is making. And then he's saying, for the same reasons that the Father continues working, even on the Sabbath, the God makes the rains fall, the sun rise, he keeps the earth together. For the same reason the Father does it, I do it. That's why he works on the Sabbath. That's why he heals on the Sabbath at this point. He's saying, I, God is continuously working, upholding the universe, even now, even on the Sabbath, and I do it for the same reasons he does it. Whatever justifies God's continuous work also justifies my own. Second, in this passage, Jesus says, God is my father. Now, sometimes in the, in the first century, a corporate group might refer to God as our father, uh, but it wasn't particularly common, uh, but never as an individual which is one of the reasons Jesus begins to get on people's radars fairly early in his ministry career, never as an individual. Jesus' claim is understood at this point. He is calling God his Father, and that calling God his Father in the way that he does, he is also saying he is equal with the Father. That's why we see in verse, 17, or verse 18, for this reason the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also is calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So John's making that point explicit. When Jesus is doing these things, he is saying he is equal with God. And the Jews, the Jewish leadership at the time understood that. They correctly understand that. This is not an uh, incorrect inference. They correctly understand what Jesus is doing. So in what ways is Jesus like the father? How, how does this unity work? Well, first he says, I submit to the Father. This is interesting. In verse 19, 
Therefore Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in a like manner. Jesus' unity with the Father is based on Jesus observing the Father, Jesus seeing the Father, and Jesus doing what the Father does. So he heals the man because he, the Father wants him to heal the man. He's obedient. One implication of their relationship is that uh, when we talk about the Trinity, we talk about three persons in one essence, right? So we have three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one essence, they are the Godhead. And one of the implications is that they have distinct roles. The Father initiates, he sends, he commands, he commissions, he grants. And on, for his behalf, the Son responds, obeys, performs his Father's will, and he ends up receiving authority. Jesus is saying, what God does, I see. And therefore, what God does, I do. Why does Jesus heal the lame man on the Sabbath? Because he obeys the Father. He is doing what he sees his Father doing. Second, Jesus reveals the Father. So in his unity with the Father, he reveals the Father. This is in verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show greater works than these so that you will marvel. So Jesus sees what the Father is doing, and he tells people about it. He explains what the Father is doing. He explains that the Father is working even until now. He explains why he does the things he does. He explains who the Father is and how he is important to our lives. In part, we must understand uh, that the lame man is healed because God wants him healed. This is revealed by the son actually healing him, right? God wants to have a relationship with us. He wants the healed lame man to be healed. So Jesus submits to the father. Jesus reveals the father. Jesus gives life like the father. As he heals the man, he gives life. In verse 21, for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to those whom he wishes. In the Old Testament, life and death were the prerogative of God alone. Anybody who took on life and death was taking on the place of God. This is clearly understood. But Jesus is saying, I have those same rights. Life and death are given to me. Life, as we have seen previously, is a major theme in John. That Jesus gives life means that Jesus is doing the work of the Father. He gives life to those whom he wants to give life. He heals in order to give people life now. Just as Jesus chose one man out of the crowd by the pool, he still gives life today. You know, even when we are ungrateful, and actually because we are ungrateful, Jesus continues to give life to us today. Briefly, Romans 5.8 Romans 5.8 says this, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the idea here that he is saying. While we were yet sinners, while we were still ungrateful, Jesus began his work in us. Next, Jesus judges. Jesus judges. 5.22 for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Now, again, Jesus is given the right to judge, which is actually probably why he can also give life and death. That God has granted him judgment. And we often consider Jesus as the kind of person who doesn't judge. That's wrong. <laughs> it's very clear. I am the one who is going to judge. All will be accountable to him one day. All of our decisions, all of our actions will be laid bare, laid bare before him. But it's not judgment by works. Instead, it is, do you believe in me? See, in John, uh, the idea that the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. John 6, 29. 
says this. Jesus answered and said to him, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. That is the good work that they are talking about. We will be accountable to him one day. Have I believed in what Jesus has done for me? Even when we are ungrateful, because we are ungrateful, Jesus reached out his hand to us. And then finally, the same the way that Jesus is unified with the Father is he is worshipped like the Father. Verse 23, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Uh, sorry. So that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. To honor is not just to say nice things. It's to worship. That's the context that we're in. It's to worship. Those who worship the Father worship the Son. Jesus is at one with the Father, not just in activity, but in honor as well. Jesus will be worshipped as the Father is worshipped. And then, because the Father sent Jesus, those who do not worship Jesus, we are told, are not worshiping the Father. Those who have rejected Jesus have rejected the Father and his good work. So why does Jesus heal an ungrateful person? To demonstrate who he is. To demonstrate his unity with the Father. To demonstrate that he is Lord. He is one with the Father. Thank you, Jesus, that he continues to do the work of the Father today. I have been the lame and ungrateful man. Ungrateful for the work of God in my own life fighting, kicking, and screaming as God wants to change me. In fact, the lame man's ungratefulness is pretty tame next to how I act some days. <laughs> but I find that God is still at work in my life today. And I believe God is still at work in your life today. Do you know why God is still at work? Because of who he is. This is what Jesus was getting at. Because of who he is. Jesus' uh, summary statement rings true for us today. My father is working until now, and I myself am working. This statement is as true today as it was the day that Jesus spoke it. The father is still at work in this world, and that means he is still at work in his people today, even when we are ungrateful, especially when we are ungrateful. He is at work in your life. Do you know where? Do you know where? If you're not sure, I'd check the places that you're ungrateful. Because that's probably where he's beginning to change your heart. That's probably the place that he's beginning to put his own uh, thoughts and desires into your own heart. You might find the work of God in your life at that place. Let's pray. God, we thank you for uh, the work that you do, the work that you have continued to do for us, uh, the work that you have done in uh, the lame man. God, we thank you that uh, when Jesus came, he continued to do the work of the Father. He continues to show us who you are. Uh, he continues to reveal you to us. Uh, Lord, I pray that this morning we would uh, be open to your hand. God, would we be grateful for the work that you do in our lives. Will we begin to see you uh, the way that you are meant to be seen? In Jesus' name, amen.